acquisitions and, and friends, if you're going to grow, you're going to have to acquire people. Okay, all of this deal of uh, organic growth, that's nice, and blah, 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 blah. Go out and buy a million and a half dollar deal. It's just as easy, and people say, oh, hey, you might as well buy one seven million as a million and a half. I mean, no, 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 no. It's a lot easier to buy a million and a half. Not just the money, it's just easier to incorporate them into your culture. But you're gonna to have to acquire. That's the name of the game. And if you're down here in the five, the three, the seven million, you better start making contacts to acquire. And, and what you do is you look at your people in your area and you get to know them. Don't look at them as some bastard competitor. Get to know them, take them out and talk to them. Boy, it's a tough deal, you know, all this working from home, oh man. Hey, listen, and especially if they're over 60 years age, I mean, our industry is aging, man. There's so many three and four million dollar dealers, they don't know what to do. Their kids are incompetent, they don't know what to do. <laughs> so go help them out, go help them out. And, and on perpetuations, I'm gonna be very blunt. Uh, I, I look at Tim Renninger sitting over there, and I don't know Tim well. I've talked to him a few times. He came to my conferences 30 years ago or something. But I do know his two sons fairly well. And he's really lucky. He's really, the hardest thing I've had to do in my 40 years in the business is to sit down, I had to do it six times, and tell parents that they had free choices. They could either come back and run the business completely, they could let their kids run it and lose the family jewels because their kids were incompetent, or they could sell it. And that's a very tough conversation to have with somebody. But my friends, I want to grab all of you, as fathers, as mothers, if your kids, if it's not a match for them, if it's, let them go do something they'll be happy at. Don't, don't give your kids a job. You're just enabling, enabling them. You're hurting them. Let them go fly free. And it breaks my heart. I can't tell you how. I mean, I've worked with 78 companies, folks. Every one of them is a family business. And you see, the father, why oh, my son's going to be a, and then we put him into sales, and there are no more salesmen, you know, than whatever. Are you all with me? I, I, I don't mean to be a downer here, but perpetuations are tough. If you're under 60 years of age, you don't need to be worrying about an exit strategy and all that kind of consultant talk. If you're over 60 years of age, if you're over 65, you better start thinking. It takes somewhere between five to seven years to build a team to perpetuate it to. Hello, everybody. You don't perpetuate your company to your kid. You perpetuate your company to a team, and hopefully your kid is a competent enough to be the head of that team. And the ones that think they're just going to step out and pump the kid in, it never works. It never, I mean, it works sometimes, but it, it, you perpetuate the company to a team. Man, I, I, I wish I could grab you. If, you. if you're a family business, you're in for a lot of joy, and you can be in for a lot of heartbreak. You can be in for a lot of, I've seen a lot of families busted up. They just, the siblings don't talk. Once you start putting millions of dollars on the table, and Bob can validate this much more than I, you start putting millions of dollars, and all these brothers and sisters that got together, so, so oh, or that'll never happen to our family. Oh, yes, it does. Millions of dollars change a lot of things. Let's have the last slide, and then I'll be done. I think, yeah. I want to talk about life for a minute. As I said, I'm 77 years old. I, uh, I work out, I do Pilates. Ha! Hard to tell that. I keep pulling this out. Uh, I have a trainer. I mean, it's ridiculous. And then to look like this, that's what's going to happen. <laughs> but I share with you, my friends, it happens real fast. It happens real fast. I can remember when I was 28 years old. I still hallucinate I'm 28. But it happens real fast, and as you all sit here, 
And one of the things that we all are encountering is work. And I want to talk about a person that was the biggest influence in my life. I want to talk about my mom. I've only talked about my dad once. My dad died when he was 41. Jenny Fish is the only one in the room that has heard when I talk at Great America, I talked about my dad. It's the only time I've ever talked about it. And I'm, I'm, I'm up here trying to figure out which one, but I want to talk about my mom for just a few minutes. I want to share this with all of you. My mom, my dad was 41 when he died. He had lung cancer, LSMFT. He smoked three to four packs of lunch <coughs> a day. And he died. Never been sick a day in his life, so he didn't have any insurance. Uh, my mom had a high school education, but that was all. She was 39. My older brother Bob was 13. I was 10. John was 2, and Danny was 8 months. And my mom got us all together. They got Bob and my the two little boys were not involved in. But my mom got Bob and me together, and she said, Robert, you're really brilliant, and he was. My brother went all through high school and grade school and never had to be. He went to the Naval Academy from the Little Catholic High School in, in Salina, Kansas, and he graduated 12th in his class. Bob was brilliant. He said, so you're going to help me go to night school and help me learn this. Uh, help me especially with the math. And then she turned to me and she says, now Michael, you're not as smart as you are. So you're going to go out on State Street every Monday and pick up pop bottles. It was out kind of outside town. And take them back. In those days, you young people can't even relate to this, but you could get a nickel for a pop bottle. So you take them back in. And you're responsible for spam and peanut butter. That's what we're going to eat. So, and, and hey, folks, I'm, I'm the happiest. I'm the luckiest guy in the world. So we kind of went along. My mom got her teaching degree, then she got a master's in psychology, then she got a master's in administration. Quite a story. My mom lived to be 92 years of age. And mom, when she died, I'm the only son in Kansas City. We had her in a, a home, and <laughs> this is a quick note, I, I'm almost done, but this is a, just such a classic Betty story. The doctor came in and said, Betty, I can keep you alive another three or four years with on medicines and stuff. Or I can bring in hospice, you'll never suffer, you won't feel a bit of pain, you'll go to sleep, and you'll join our Lord. My mom immediately said, well, Michael, what do you think I ought to do? And I said, well, Mom, <laughs> I've made a lot of decisions with me. This ain't one of them. So she sat there for about 10 minutes, literally, and said, and then the great part of this story, she then interviewed three different hospice organizations. I didn't even know there were three, three different. And she interviewed them. She called them in. She had her list of questions. And she, and, and she said, OK, I'll take that one. My mom was lying there. And right before she went into a coma, now here's a lady that had had four little boys. Had really no money. She was a teacher, a kindergarten teacher. And she turned to me and she said, Michael, tell your brothers that I've had a wonderful life. My mom had $10,000 when she died. $6,000 went for her funeral, and each boy got four. I mean, each boy got one to make up the four. Now, the rest of the story, I think, is what I really want to share with you. Mom died. We put it in the Salina Journal. We lived in Kansas City. Salina's three hours west of, of Kansas City. And she'd been away from Salina for maybe 20 years. And so we had the funeral mass in Kansas City. We drove out to Salina the next day. And the cemetery's up on the hill. We drove up the hill, and there was an umbrella up there, a tent thing. And there were about 75 people there. And I thought, man, mom's 92. Who 
Who are all of these people? I mean, seems open. I mean, who would they be? So we went in, and you know, Catholics, we know how to bury them, and we know how to marry them. And then you put the casket on, and then the priest turns the handle, and the casket kind of drops, and oh, everybody in there drop. I mean, and then everybody disperses. So I started walking around, and I say, how'd you know my mom? Oh, your mom taught me kindergarten. And I see your mom down in Santa Fe, and she always asks how I was. Well, hey, how, how'd you know my mom? Oh, your mom taught me kindergarten. She was a great kindergarten teacher, and, and when she'd see me around town, she'd always ask me how I was and how the family was. Hey, how, how'd you know my mom? Oh, your mom taught me kindergarten. And every time I'd see her, she'd always ask how I was. To me, there's two points to the story. One is my mom treated those kindergartners and those other people like they were real. And my mom was never, 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 my mom was never caged by imaginary bars. My mom ran free. And the second lesson is she treated them like they were real. The second lesson is, his work is noble. My mom taught me that from when I was a little boy. There is honor in work. And I don't think we talk about that enough. I think we talk about retiring and all that. There's great honor in work. Work is noble. And I think it's up to all of you, and it's up to me, to share that with not be critical of them because they want to, uh, some of the stories that Mr. Gowdy uh, was sharing, because they stay with their parents and teach them the value of work. Teach them the value of work. Treat them like they're real. Treat them like they're real. I made a commitment to you at the beginning that right here I would leave my soul. I hope that I try to do that. I thank you all for all of your attention. I'll make one last thing, and this is big. This is something new. My phone number is 816-668-2170. And if you would ever have something going on in your time, you call me. I won't remember who you are, but you tell me that you heard me here, and you run it by me. I, I might have to say I don't have a clue. I don't know. But I might know.